Wisdom. Prudentia. Justice. Justicia. Temperance. Temperantia. Courage. Fortitudo. Applying ancient philosophy to modern life, this is the Sunday Stoic. And we're on, I hope. <clears throat> Welcome to the Sunday Stoic Podcast. My name is Steve coming to you from, let me look out the window, sunny Conway, Arkansas at the moment. Uh, Storms are on the way. Um, I am joined today by Dr. Kai Whiting, who is coming to us from Portugal. I always forget which part of the map you're on because it changes every once in a while. Where, Where are you coming to us from, Kai? Lisbon, Portugal. Oh, you're in Lisbon again? Okay. Yep. And um, what are you doing in Lisbon? Well, it's strange because I shouldn't really be here. I'm supposed to be working in Belgium, but because of the COVID pandemic, I wasn't able to get to Belgium because the borders have been closed. And then when they have been open, these ones have been closed. And then when they're open over there, like, it's great. You go, you think, oh, I'm going to go over there. <clears throat> Can't get a flight. And then you say, okay, great. And when you, get, when you can finally try and get a flight, the university is closed. And no one can receive you because they need to give you your paperwork because you've supposed to have been working there for a year and you don't even have an ID card. So the first time in my life that I'm like, yes, I belong to a university that I don't have an ID card for and I do a lot of work in their name. I'm sure they appreciate it because I haven't met them. And so it's quite challenging. It's a, it's a challenging time. And I, I think it's challenging in the sense of a middle class challenge of kind of being like, OK, so I'm not supposed to be here, but I'm here I'll just make the best, you know, do the best job I can. Uh, it is difficult not to have your colleagues and not to know exactly what they expect from you. That's been quite challenging. It's the first time where, well, as an academic, you can normally get left to your own devices, but this is this is beyond what I expect. A new level yeah. of that, yeah. Yeah, can you just do some work, please? And I'm like, <laughs> well, yes. And they do want you to show that you're doing work, but there's no, there's absolutely no faculty direction, um, which is strange, I'm sure. Yeah, you you understand when I that say that. That does seem very yeah ex- yeah that that is strange. I well I'm I hope your uh, stoic philosophy is uh is paying dividends here and keeping you sane through this uh, difficult time. I I think it has. I mean, because you think what's in my control. So I literally can only control my output. If it's not the output that they would like exactly, but they haven't told me, then I have to just go okay. Well, I can't control how, if I'm ticking the right boxes for the faculty, because I don't know what the boxes are. And that could be you as <laughs> nothing, if not for boxes, right? Yeah, yeah. And committees about boxes. Oh, yeah, committees um, about boxes. <clears throat> At least I don't have to do them, right? <laughs> That's right. So part uh, part of your output has been uh, maybe not related to your, uh, your current uh, uh, university situation, uh, is a book called Being Better, Stoicism for a World Worth Living in. Uh, which you have co-written with uh, Leonidas. How do you say his last name? Constantikos. I'd, I'd like. I, I think Taco Bell should use it as Constant Tacos. That would be the perfect last name <laughs> for Mexican. I'll tell you, you said that. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, something more authentic than Taco Bell, but still, nonetheless. Yeah, yeah, excellent. Well, this book. When did it release? Just a f- last week, a few weeks so ago. So, if you're in the US, mm-hmm. it released on the sixth of April. If you're in the UK. It releases on the 6th of May, but I think the Swiss Canal scenario is like confusing things. And I don't know at the moment, we don't know if the book will arrive, physical copies of the book will arrive in the quantities that people want them in. So I'm not saying there's going to be a massive rush, but I, if, if I haven't received the book yet, for example. So a lot of uh, like American colleagues are saying, well, oh, great, I have a copy of your book. I'm like, I don't. <laughs> so, and they tell me things like, you should really speak to the authors. You know, you need to make friends with the authors. They would make sure you've got a copy all the time if you were as friendly as I am with them, which is a wonderful, <laughs> which is a wonderful, <laughs> wonderful joke. So, yeah, it's, and then in, in Australia, it's coming a bit later. The reason why this is a, uh, more of a complex operation is because the publisher is slightly smaller. So it's not a penguin. So it does all its own sort of distribution, whereas Penguin has a US office, a Canadian office, Australian office, and then they have the copies there and they can print them, not on demand, but certainly nearer to the market. These ones are all printed on recycled paper. That's great. In Canada, and they all come across from Canada, which is not, you know, there's nothing, you know, the Swiss Canal, you think, well, there's nothing wrong with that. What's the difference between that and like the UK? No, but because everything is behind and everything's been messed up, all the shipping lanes have been messed up. Like you don't really prioritize, say, books over 
perishable goods. So um, they haven't told me the details, but it, we are hoping that it gets there before the 24th of May. If we could be really lucky, it's difficult to say. Again, not in my sure. control and not the ideal situation because people are already saying, well, why didn't the Americans get it first? Like, they get everything first, no. you know, like all these kind of technolo- technologies and things. So yeah, the 6th of April in the US, but hopefully when this uh, podcast releases, at least somebody would have got their hands on the copy. I have a PDF version myself at the moment, but uh, but yeah, I, I, I have seen uh, seen physical copies appearing on Twitter from various individuals, I believe, who have received a copy uh, in the U.S. anyway. Now, um, I know you want to uh, be the interviewer in some uh, ways today, but before we do that, just let me just ask you this. What inspired you to write this kind of book on Stoicism? So this book's a little different maybe than uh, something you might have read from Ryan Holiday, for example, or or uh, Massimo uh, Piliucci. This is a little a little different take on Stoicism. I, I I see a lot of Kai in the in the pages here in terms of the themes chosen. So what what uh, gave you the drive to to put this project together? It's really nice that you say that because you know me quite well. As I think you said I'm like the most common guest. So it's quite nice that you do know me well enough to be like Kai's bleeding all over this book. <laughs> I, I can I can feel I can feel it. I think the most frustrating thing about self-help is that it's not actually self-help. Self-help typically is like not so much stoic stuff, but in general, if you do exactly what I did in the exact same manner, you would succeed in exactly the same way. So I've just literally written a piece for modern stoicism saying like, I'm quite sure I'm five foot five, Leo is six foot. If we are trying to get toilet roll from the top shelf and I follow his instructions of stand next to his shelf, lift arms up, pick toilet roll. If I do that, little me is just not going to reach the toilet roll. It doesn't matter how much I believe my arms will grow. They were not. So in part, it was that self-help to me means that I give you the framework so that you can help yourself. So you can ask yourself better questions because in the book, as we say, really early on, we don't provide any answers. Not to your specific situation, because there's a thing of like, you should, you know, you should walk in my, you know, a mile in my shoes. Well, your shoes don't fit me. Right. So that's not really helpful. Yeah. It's not a book that says, okay, journal three times a week, take cold showers and premeditate about the evils of the upcoming commute. You know, that's, that's not the kind of advice in the book for sure. Yeah. I, because I just found that just the opposite of self-help. If I'm telling you what to do based on my personality. So I think I told you before, like I've told your audience before, I like to journal by writing papers, but I wouldn't recommend that to like 99% of the population because they probably wouldn't benefit from that. At the same time, I don't benefit from meditating over and over and over again in the way that, for example, is mentioned by Donald Robertson. And it doesn't mean that it's not valuable. It's just not valuable to me. So I was very sort of like skeptical that I should give out advice when 99% of advice doesn't really relate to me. Mm-hmm. And that becomes particularly dif- different when I live, say, if, if I live in Colombia and I'm like, okay, so if I do A, B and C, I get this, I get D, E and F. Oh, but the law is different, so I can't do that. Oh, but the culture is completely different. Oh, so I can't do that. Oh, but the language restriction is different, so I can't do that. So I wanted to create with Leo a book which would say, I'm going to help you ask yourself better questions. Because in my, I can honestly say that my life has improved since I've improved the quality of my questions. And I don't think life gets better in the sense that we suddenly have no problems. I think our problems get better, as in they're less difficult to deal with. So I wanted to say it didn't matter if you're from Ghana, Thailand, Australia, New Zealand, even Greenland. I was like, I want to help you ask the questions you need to ask yourself. Now, I don't know what those questions are because I'm not you. And even if I were in your, in your shoes, I'd still have all my baggage right, of being a British person, of being male, of being married. That's definitely, definitely baggage, right? So I'd have all that, all that, <laughs> I'd have all that baggage. So if I was to tell somebody, well, if I were in your shoes, if I was sitting in Greenland and I wanted to know if I should and buy an ice cream, then the you know in a very cold country, you'd say, well, probably I'd be really cold. But someone who's lived there their whole life might say, well, if I had that you know attitude towards ice cream, I'll never eat an ice cream. So, well, that's how you think. That's not how I think. So this is the problem that I have with self-help. It, it basically says that if you follow my 10-step program, you'll succeed and do exactly what I achieved the reality is i did a 10-step program let's say and it worked exactly for me because i am who i am 
So I want you to learn how to create your own 10 step program and not tell you what those 10 steps are. And people were like, I mean, I spoke to the Philadelphia Stoics last week, so I will shout out to them, but they were freaking out partly. Some of them were going, but what's the answer? Like, I don't have the answer, but I want to know. Okay, I can help you structure the question so you get to your own answer. And we did that. We did that as a group. And they were like, oh yeah, this is something that I can do. And that to me is self-help by definition, but the self-help industry doesn't want to tell you that because that way you can keep producing more and more books. Just you haven't picked the right 10 step program yet. And I well, think how, that's- how many how many folks have a shelf of self-help books because well that one didn't quite do it for me. Maybe this one will, maybe this one will, maybe this one will. And and you can fall into a treadmill, a, a hedonistic self-help treadmill, as it were, where you never get anywhere. I think it has I think self-help is really, really helpful if you're looking at for something very, very specific. So if you want to know how to set up a you know motor mechanic shop. Right, or a garage, I should say, and you find yourself a book with somebody who does exactly that, there's elements of that is that's going to be really, really helpful. So if you said to me, Kai, I really want to know how to set up an entrepreneur business in Silicon Valley, it, would you recommend your book? I'll be like, no, that's <laughs> probably not the best book that you can buy for that purpose. And if they said like, you know, if I, I want to decide how I pick someone to marry, I'd say, well, yes, because it would ask you how you do that. But if you're looking for the, the person you should marry and you should follow my instructions, then I, it's not the right book. And I just didn't really see that. So I kind of see my book like beating up the other self-help books and trying to knock them off the shelf and go, this isn't really self-help. And the other people are like, don't bite the hand that feeds you. So I can see the other self-help books, like the really weighty tomes, like jumping in my tiny book, going, you scumbag and like punching this poor book i think i think you've been isolated too long kai you're having book fights in your head now (laughs) i am having book fights in my head absolutely (laughs) but i just thought it was a really useful image to say like it it is literally i mean it wasn't the irony wasn't lost on me the publisher was like wait a minute your self-help book is like anti-self-help like no my self-help book is self-help the other stuff is anti-self-help you know on some level that's true and then on other levels yeah maybe it is a bit anti-self-help and i said well that's not my fault i mean i didn't come up with the categories do i so yeah it was kind of like a an uncomfortable relationship with oneself while i was writing it but it's it's a it's essentially nine chapters um that that uh, and and it's a something you could read in, in, you know, a a weekend or so probably if you have time. Uh, So it's not uh, uh, overwhelming in that sense, but each chapter tends to focus on a specific stoic historically, uh, as well as, uh, 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 and and perhaps a virtue or some aspect of something to think about in terms of living a good life. And then you bring in examples of more modern individuals who, who fit the bill there. And and then you uh, end each chapter with a few questions uh, to ponder on for for the reader. And uh, I also liked uh, uh, you have lots of lots of uh, famous Stoics, some less uh, well known Stoics uh, in here. And then you bookend, I believe, chapter one and nine is uh, is devoted to Zeno, um, kind of the the beginning of the the promise of the good life, and then how to carry on and and think about death and other other things uh, at the end there to to live a life that's transformed and and and, and it, it it fit together really well and, and there were some interesting stoics in there that we've discussed briefly in the past but it was n- nice to read about the uh, uh I, I is it spherus um and and a few of those other stoics that you just don't hear about nearly as much and i found it to be a a very a very good book and i uh, recommend that folks check it out well, I purposely decided with Leia that we wouldn't put Seneca in. I think I told you this before, just because that would annoy Seneca. So I thought, how can we annoy Seneca? Like, how can we test his stoicism? T- by not sticking Seneca, the most prolifically <laughs> prolific writer of, of that we have. We'll just, yeah, but exactly. Seneca was uh, obviously probably a little bit in love with Seneca. So uh, so I'd say that, you know, that that's fine. <laughs> yeah, we've got, well, we're thinking about, like, we're planning the second book, and Seneca's definitely the way that we're planning it will be in there so i can't tell you much about it but we did want to we thought how can you if you can do a book without seneca then you actually remove some of the the challenges that you really need to go into in quite some depth because seneca is a really interesting character so we were like he's not so good in my opinion he's not so good at like doing like that one thing i just want to talk about that one thing in like one chapter that's really not seneca 
So it, Tunica didn't, all, you know, as much as I did actually want to annoy Tunica, and that was my prime reason, like my silly prime reason. My other one was like, Seneca just cannot do one category because Seneca is so prolific. You know, all credit where it's due, he was extremely prolific and very significant. And it just couldn't tell why one story about Seneca. So it was like, maybe you have to change the framing of the book. So there was also that to it. But I did say I was going to ask you some questions. So Yeah, go ahead, go ahead teacher well, i was going to say like what did you um when you just saw i mean when you saw the book like they say never judge a book by its cover but we all do so like you didn't get a cover though did you to be fair you had a uh, let me scroll up to the top of my pdf there it is i see the cover i love the cover actually tell me about yeah what do you think when you see that cover it's like a rorschach test is this what you're doing to me kai <laughs> um i see I've, puppies I wish I and was. rainbows and um well uh what I like about the cover is the uh, the uh, the refle- in my mind it's a an ancient ancient ruins uh, and then a reflection in in you know what appears to me to be a pool of water but it's a modern city being reflected so the, the uh, like my podcast which is applying ancient philosophy to modern life uh, um, it's the idea of that connection between the old and the modern and um, that's what you know stood out to me was that interesting they're both connected they both share a foundation they both meet at the bottom uh, as it were but uh, but uh, we can learn from the past but I don't know if this comes through in the picture but uh, we also know that we will have to discard some things from the past to move forward as well because not everything is good because it's old um <laughs> And that's what we tried to do. I mean, I remember the design team getting really excited. And I think, think people get excited when they really capture the idea in the moment. And I was really, really pleased because whenever you, you don't really own the cover, right? But in your head, you have what you'd like it to be and what you like it to be and what's, what's in somebody else's head when you say, okay, here's the book, here's my vision. And you basically, you have to, unless you're, I guess, perhaps very, very famous and you get to have you know, more of a lion share it, you're just basically handing over your baby to these people that you've never met and hoping to God, to Zeus, or to whoever you hold dear, that they, they might capture it. And I was just really impressed that the team there did manage to capture it. And the idea is that it is connected, but it's not the same. Because you are kind of have like, in the Stoic community, I find that you, you, there's this real emphasis on what did the Stoics say? And we focus a lot and there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, Tony Long, uh, A.A. Lon is one of my favorite people in the whole world, like a mentor to, of mine. And that's exactly what he does. But you and I, Steve, you, we both know that I don't do that so well. So I really <laughs> wanted the opportunity to be like, okay, what does Sturgeon say about climate change? What does it say about those modern issues? And the answer is nothing, next to nothing. And a lot of people get worried about that because they want that tick box. They want that concrete just tell me what to do. And you're like, well, I can't. I can't tell you what to do because that's actually anti-Stoic. If I'm telling you what to do, you, it's actually, you're not engaged. That's why it's Socratic reasoning. It's, it's in the process. It's in the dialogue. And that, that, got, that gets lost on people. And when they do look, you know, towards Stoics, and there is like, you see this, the ancient Stoic, and it's like, right, I'm going to do exactly what these ancients did. Even though the ancients were like, don't do that. Like, <laughs> right. <think> of, <laughs> so yeah, I'm, I'm glad that you, you captured that. I was going to ask you, so when you... Um, when you read the first chapter, uh, how did you feel? Because of all the chapters, it's my least favorite. I'm giving you all these all these sneak sneak previews now, but I just thought we should talk about the process rather than the book per se. So the uh, let me let me I have to get my head back into chapter one. Uh, so Zeno's boat sinks, right? Uh, <coughs> excuse me, and and we're we're talking about the promise of philosophy or something like that. I can't remember the title. I, I could scroll down and cheat, but. Um, so we're we're introduced to Zeno and this concept of uh, you have kind of a whole introduction to Stoicism here in this chapter, the virtues and 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 you know I, I thought it was well done. I mean that's always kind of hard because it's like oh here we go I have to give the whole intro to Stoicism again because you don't know who's going to pick up your book. Uh, it may be a, a devout Stoic or maybe someone who says what's a stoic uh, and and so it has to appeal to everyone and i i thought it was it was well done what what do you not like about your chapter kai i think because it, it's exactly for the reason you just said like you couldn't pitch it 
to the person who had no, you know, you couldn't pitch it to the expert. Like you really wanted to go into depth and say, do you really believe something's indifferent? Do you really believe slavery is indifferent? Like ask a really tough question. <laughs> right, right. The the real meat of, meat the, of the real meat matter of it. here, yeah. But at the same time, you, you couldn't pitch it to the beginner because you 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 didn't want the people who'd been like read like the 10th book they've read to just switch off. And it it was a really uncomfortable wrestling game. Because on one hand, you've got to be really clear and concise. But if you're too concise, you've lost the audience. It was just real, real challenge. And I don't think that we quite pulled it off. I don't, I don't think I was, Leah and I were good enough writers to quite pull it off in quite the, the way that we wanted to. Like people said they really liked that chapter. But to me, I think the book really comes into its own, like after about ch chapter four or five. So it's like, I personally felt like a chapter four or five, really, you really get that sort of, that flavor, but that's quite frustrating as an author, right? Because you're like, the first chapter has to be amazing. And it did its job. Like it was like, you know, I you maybe think about stories in a different way. Like you were really like one of the examples you gave is like, how do I decide if I should drink milk? Like something really basic, like what is the stoic process of deciding anything? And yeah, and talk that, about we, that. we've talked about that, I think, in previous episodes as well. Like, should I eat meat in this situation? Well, are you on a island where there's nothing else to eat or are you somewhere where there's a factory farm where you're getting your you know there are contingencies that 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 are at play and that's hard as you said it, what you're asking of the the listener is to be a philosopher not a minion right yeah absolutely and so we we've seen that seen that story was great because it i mean because it's so again the antithesis of self-help right it, particularly the business self-help end of the shelf and it was like he's and it, you know he just said like my greatest success was becoming being the biggest business failure so i it was one to like shake somebody who's sitting there who's probably you know read a ryan hardy book and that's more or less all they've read and they just happened to be in the in the bookshop and they look at it and go wait a minute zeno's greatest success was being a business failure and that just <laughs> flies in the face of america corporate america like everything that the American dream stands for is not being a business failure. That That's just not even like a possibility. That's like contradicting the American dream of, of being sufficiently successful to own your piece of land, right? And he's, and he's like, wait a minute, the best thing I ever did was like lose everything, wander over to, over to the Oracle. And I think, for example, the Oracle just gets brushed over. I don't know if you've noticed that, but most of us like in the modern or the contemporary sense, we're like, Oracle, terrible. And I kind of waited to give the Oracle her dues. I was like, this woman did like, or various women, really actually did something important in the in the in the ancient world. If we just say, oh well, stars, let's get rid of everything, let's just ignore everything that just makes us uncomfortable, the Oracle kind of goes out, and the baby and the bathwater will get chucked out. And there's no kind of reflection of why the Oracle is significant. So we also felt like in chapter one that we needed to give the Oracle her dues. And kind of put her in the core of like the context of stoicism because that's the other problem when you strip stoicism down to some self-help and you just say okay well that's historic that's not even relevant then you're actually ignoring the fact that people go to their shrink or they take you know a, they go on a south american ritual and they try to get some kind of understanding from the from the earth they kind of need to feel at one with the universe and they kind of need some kind of packaging about how they would understand it that's that's external to them because that's what humans humans we tend not always but we tend to do so i also wanted to give like the oracle her due and i was like leo you've got to help me with this because it's really <laughs> complicated to 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 give the oracle kind of like yes we are contemporary but yes her story as the oracle and Zeno's has value especially when we return back to the oracle with like Hergus, which is the this the spartan legendary figure in chapter seven so you start to bring in we try to like weave in all these loose ends that get cut off literally they get sliced off particularly with roman stories and that's not important divination that's not important and say so, okay maybe it's less important but to ignore it completely it, it, it's just you just fail to understand the context of where Zeno, where Zeno's operating space and then you fail to do that you then start to look at for some clues but you've you know the context is all wrong so it becomes a self-help machine rather than how do i live my life so when the oracle tells me to do something i walk in that you know in, i you know i use my brush strokes to create whatever the oracle has asked me to do and people don't want to talk about that because it's like the science the science but you and i both know as you know scientists that science doesn't have an answer for everything 
at the moment. And you have to be content with that balance, right? You have to be like, well, maybe it's not scientific. Maybe I don't know why I love my son. Maybe I have no scientific reason for that. But there's, there's something more than that, that your love, I, I'm assuming your love for your son is more than just neurons or like your feeling towards him to do with hormonal chemicals. I don't know if, if I'm explaining it right. I, I, I think so. Um, you know, we are, we are more than facts and figures. Um, um, we might be able to reduce a lot of things back to facts and figures, but uh, the human experience is beyond we have emotion, we have uh, uh, experience, we have awe and wonder and, and, uh, uh, you know, I, I can only imagine, I, we don't really have in our everyday experience, uh, uh, an oracle in quite the same way, like you have to go on a pilgrimage or a journey. Like if I wanted to have some ayahuasca, I'd have to uh, travel across several borders and, and uh, and to go to Peru, for example, you know, I, I, I'm trying to think if there's any examples of this that are more more uh, uh, every day, maybe not every day, but, you know, more milestone ish in the life of a human. But uh, where you get some kind of mystical advice or 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 something you have to interpret and chew on and then try to figure out if you can put it into practice and that it's interesting to think of if you were given some kind of advice that didn't quite make a literal sense, because a lot of times when you read what the oracles say, there's a lot of interpretation required, but it's like base your life on, or, or on this sentence. <laughs> and, and then the sentence doesn't quite make sense. And you're like, okay, what do I do with this? Like take on the color of dead men or, uh, or, or whatever. And, and, and uh, it is beyond the experience of a lot of us these days, I think, especially as we're more and more secular uh, than we than we used to be. Absolutely. And I think that was why we tried to show that just, the Oracle was like, you could just rock up. We got this idea that if, someone, if they had enough money, they could just rock up to the Oracle. And it's like nothing is further from the truth. Like it was like really like, yeah, know yourself. <laughs> like if you didn't know yourself, then that cryptic clue meant nothing. And people might, you know, might laugh it now, but the people got, you know, people got a clear point. Like, a lot of enough people go that it's still, you know, it's still something important to them. And on, on some level, even the politicians, they're pretty cryptic. You, you go to their manifesto and it's a very cryptic document and people put a lot of hope and faith in the next four years over what, you know, I know Tony Blair might have said or Joe Biden might say or what George Bush Sr. said. And a lot of it, even though it sounds silly, like, well, you're putting your faith in what they say, like, <laughs> you're not in control of that. But to us, that seems completely normal that, uh, a politician would say a cryptic and they are very cryptic you know edu Tony Blair, education 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 whatever that meant you couldn't disagree <laughs> with it because obviously you wanted more education but he was <laughs> right. a masterful thinker like that and it's like you, we laugh when we think about the oracle but we forget that when Tony Blair did the education education or even Al Gore says some really interesting cryptic for me as a scientist a cryptic uh, view on how climate change was causing a massive problem because we we're having people who had malaria in Canada and was kind of ignoring the fact that they probably got on a flight and lived in Canada. So you had this like cryptic sort of lifestyle. And unfortunately, or fortunately, most of us don't live according, we like to say we live according to facts. That would be a Lawrence Becker statement. But actually, most of us lived according to a set number of facts. And then a set number of, we've always done it this way, so we're going to carry on. Um, and I think the Oracle, just we just need to understand that that's the, the equivalent that we have to my granddad did it this way, therefore I do it this way, even though I, was not, I know it's not necessarily the best way, but it works for me. So I quite like the idea that people are like, well, I'm not sure if the Oracle is the best person, but it worked for my granddad and I'm sure it's going to work for me. And then you literally take that and you run your farm based on your granddad's principles, even though there may be a better technology because you just know what you know and that's what you, that's what, that's your story. So we just wanted to tell Zeno's story and not take out the awkward, quote unquote, awkward oracle because otherwise again it silences the voices people say oh you know there's no female stoics there's no powerful uh, female presence take out the oracle of course you've just taken out one of the most fundamentally important voices in the history of the ancient world so again we try to do it like if some people might call it what's and all we just try to be as as um as contextual you know contextualize the stoics as much as we could although i i know that we did often provide in the majority of cases modern examples but we thought that we had to tell the story of the Stoics as much as we could 
from their point of view using their eyes and their ears. And that involved the oracle. Did you learn anything did, or was you surprised to see the oracle, for example, or did you learn anything from it? Or uh, I, I don't know if I was surprised. I mean, I've, I've, you know, I'm familiar with the, with the, with the, with the story and, and uh, I guess I didn't make the connection of, I, I thinking back yeah the Oracle doesn't get brought up a lot in some other authors introductions uh, you know, unless you go into Diogenes or something and you read a little deeper. Um, I do I, I I'm trying to remember uh, I know the Oracle came up more than once uh, was it was it because of the Sparta the Spartan chapter is that where yeah. uh, I know I read about the Oracle uh, several hundred years apart from one another but I couldn't remember who yeah, the other uh, example was. So Lycurgus is this, this Spartan legendary figure and both Zeno and Lycurgus owe their sort of their way of life or the vision they have in their head to the Oracle. And the reason why Stoicism is so fundamentally um, Spartan is not because it's like we're these warriors running around being stoic with a little ass. It's like literally the, the land reforms, the social economic reforms, the whole sort of vision of, of Cleomenes the third, who we find out, you know, find with his wife in chapter seven, is based on stoic principles because there is there is this connection between Lycurgus, who goes to the Oracle and has the same sort of vision of justice. I know you say it a lot better in your intro, so <laughs> justicia. Not I think me. You're saying it's not me. I don't know you. It's okay. Ian. He is a Canadian with a with a nice, sexy voice. I just, I just. <laughs> okay, I always thought it was you doing a, a a nice voice. So I think that with Lycurgus and Zeno, they both have this connection five hundred years apart, and it takes a lot of digging. Like I had to read a lot of hefty tomes or get Leo to do most of the legwork on that <laughs> one because you know. But we we forget that. So we we have this sort of superficial understanding of Stoicism and Spartan Sparta being connected, but we don't actually go deeper than the the Hollywood message. So it's really important that we went back to, to this, the Oracle again because it's just so there's just so many connections. And then theorists, who's like I don't know, he's like the Jonah of the Stoics. He goes out and says, "I'm going, you know, I'm leaving like Athens. I'm going to go out and see the world and bring Stoicism to them." And he does it such in such a way that it becomes a political or national message. And that's not something we like to hear because the Oracle, which is nothing else, was very much pro-justice. Although people go, "This is just nonsense." A lot of what the Oracle says, at least in the Stoic contents, is you know, talking about justice and self-control and knowing yourself and being courageous in the sense of being brave to stand for a message that goes beyond yourself. And Zeno, I mean, again, it was probably, you know, he was probably enamored in some way by the myth, the almost myth-like features of Lycurgus. But it is true that he is fundamentally wanting a stoa that does represent those ideals so that you know the hysteria from strength and resilience but also as i said the virtues and people don't seem to think or don't understand that sparta is more than just having a good battle it's about <laughs> being fingers on a hand it's about working together it's about putting your shield side by side it's about covering your brother or sister because the spartan females also fought for the greater good of sparta now, I'm not saying there was this probably, you know, there must be from our standards today, some kind of abuse going on because you were not an individual. As a warrior, you were not an individual. And of course, a suppressing one's individualism to that extent isn't healthy or in the same way that we've gone so far, I think, uh, in one direction towards individualistic um, pursuits. So I don't think it's healthy either. So I think Sparta has something to teach us and it isn't this 300 film, if you've ever seen that. I don't yeah. think it is a, it, it is the... Tyler Bates warfare film at all uh, you do have a sense of collectiveness but you don't see it in terms of the, in, in the film in terms of the whole the whole group of people understanding this ideal now we could argue that the ideal is not ideal right that's a different argument but to say that there's nothing that we can learn as as moderns from that experience from having that mythical situation from listening to an oracle who really is asking you to talk think about the collective state of Sparta and the state of one's being. I, I think if we took out the Oracle, you've missed the book. Well, we would have missed the point because it would be our responsibility, right? So it's almost like uh, Zeno got a message from from the Logos via the <laughs> via the Oracle and uh, and uh, began his school and that and 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 well, we can see um, 
that theme throughout the idea that no one is no man is an island uh, kind of uh, theme, I think, in, in, in several chapters where stoicism is not just about you being a badass and and uh, being able to take insults and and uh, never miss your cold shower and go into the gym every day. It's it's about um, something much larger. Uh, and and I, I, I one thing that just stuck out to me was you have a chapter on recognizing luck and Cleanthes and you, you tied it back into uh, the dog in the cart and how the leash between uh, us and our carts vary from person to person and as teachers, which of course I can, I related to that statement. Uh, uh, then we we have to realize that our students are have different uh, amounts of luck, as it were, in terms of material goods and time to study and family life. And and we often try, uh, we often need to do our part to reach out to them or to help them when we, where we can within reason uh, to to help them succeed. Because if we put everyone in the same box and assume that everyone has the exact same expectations and experiences and everyone can achieve the same level end of statement, then not everyone uh, is going to be able to keep up with that cart. Uh, someone's going to get drug along and, and not uh, not succeed like we would like. And it's not, um, not necessarily because of fate, because that's the other thing. Like you can, There's part of being dragged along by fate, but someone should sure. just get dragged along because we don't understand the nature of where they're at. And I think you've said this before, uh, that you've been able to help people that have been otherwise wouldn't have been able to be helped because you've recognized their, their needs. And that's the problem with this sort of um, Silicon Valley stoicism or even certain stoic books that perhaps emphasize that, you know, we, we've all got, we all have freedom of choice. Yes, we do have freedom of choice and that's fine. Like no one's going to take your freedom or your agency away. But it is disingenuous to think that Cleanthes has the same beliefs as Marcus Aurelius. I mean, and no one, in my view, had said that explicitly. So we all talk about everyone can read Eudaimonia, and you can be a slave, and you can be a teacher, and you can be a Socrates, and you can still read Eudaimonia. Yes, that is true. But your path is going to have more obstacles. We can't say that every path is smooth, or every path is the same direction. Because well, how uh, hard did Cleanthes work to be a Stoic guy? Okay? <laughs> extremely, it's extremely hard to get his story, actually, but I'm glad we put it together. I think Cleanthes' life is is really a good example of that somebody who who continues to stand with that arrow and try, you know, tries to hit the mark. And it's only because he stood there longer than anybody else that he achieved. And that's the other thing that people say you might say, "Oh, this person didn't succeed because they were lazy or because they didn't try hard enough," but they might have had to stand there 150 times and used to their fight. And you might have given up on the on the sit the sit go, but you just had it in your head that you were going to do five. They've been sitting there for 150, and they just can't take 151. And I think Cleanthes is a testament to saying to yourself, "Okay, I really want this. I'm gonna I'm going to achieve it." But it's all a testament that we can only do that, I believe, if we've got the right environment around us in terms of keep keep trying. I'm not saying this is not about achieving eudaimonia. It's like I'm going to keep trying to do whatever X, Y, or Z I want. But you do need the right support. So I don't think Cleanthes would have succeeded if Zeno hadn't believed him. Like we also failed to we we failed to separate eudaimonia from achieving an indifferent. So like Cleanthes being becoming the head of a stoa is actually an indifferent. So I'm not saying that Cleanthes and Zeno could, you know, all right, just hard for Cleanthes to say just to achieve eudaimonia because he didn't have his education. No, it's open. It's open. And I can't say if it was harder or easier because you, achieving eudaimonia is not about achieving material goods or, or certain states, but it was certainly harder for him to achieve, like, the this, this, this status of being the head of a star. And it may well have been harder for him to achieve eudaimonia because of, because of the way that his life was. I mean, if you've been punched in the face... I think we, we were as graphic as we could be. We try to make it mum proof, but we were as graphic as we could be about this guy was smacked in the face a few times. He was, you know, he was called a donkey and he was slow and probably because he was suffering from, you know, concussion uh, related injuries. Um, so we wanted to show that even if you had the, a big, you know, a great, terrible injury, you could still achieve. But at the same time, he was able to achieve because he was in a situation where there's, a, there's, this, there's this collective this is collective cosmopolitan spirit. And again, we talk about, you know, there's phase in Iraq, and we say, you know, it's a very individualistic philosophy. It is for the sage, <laughs> like, but we're not sages. And then we start picking a public group. Well, actually, I need help. I need support. I don't need you to spoon feed me, but I do need you to stand shoulder to shoulder with me. Well, you should be able to do it. You're stoic. 
And that's right, missing, again, that's completely missing the mark. You're every person standing there trying to hit stoicism, that's really not the bullseye. Right, yeah, you're not a, a stoic sage <clears throat> still rides in the back of the airplane. There's still got to be a crew up front flying the thing. It's, <laughs> they, Absolutely. <laughs> You know, we need we need uh, we need each other in the in that sense. It's just the um, uh, almost it's like the worst case scenario if the Stoic sage wakes up and it's like a Twilight Zone episode. I don't know if you get ever see I the old Twilight Zone over there where uh, where uh, you're the last human on Earth. Uh, you'll you'll say, oh, OK, <laughs> and you'll you'll do what you can, but. Uh, you're not going to just lay down and die necessarily because of that, but but um, the sage will be able to pick up and move on uh, in in the pursuit of virtue, even if no one's watching. But but to have others actually without others to uh, engage with, it's actually almost harder to practice virtue because virtue is in the relationships between individuals uh, and, and 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 individuals and things like how I choose to relate to my stuff is a practice of virtue, but how I choose to relate to people around me is obviously an expression of justice and of occasionally uh, courage when you have to put an end to something or stand up for something. But yeah, without others, it kind of becomes a little more, I don't know, I don't know if pointless is the word, but. uh, It's It's certainly more challenging. And I think what you're saying there makes me think like, we often think about the sage as in the sage would be able to live in this perfect eudaimonic state. Yeah, but he still thinks that having a comfortable life is a preferred indifferent. <laughs> like, it's not like the sage is like, wait a minute, I have now got you to me, do not give me a comfy chair. I only sit, I only sit on concrete floor, people. Concrete floor. I mean, yeah. that's not self-control. That's, that's stupidity. Because he'd say, or she would say, why would I sit on a concrete floor if I have a comfortable chair, mm-hmm. right? It's not... It's not that you then sacrifice every material good because that that is nothing to do with that. And that's the other point that people seem to think it's like mutually exclusive. Like even the sage would deny some comfort. You know, he he wouldn't, you know, drink on any way, shape, or form. Uh, you know, a hot chocolate with the milk that's been produced by a cow by the neighbor, and they know the cow's treated really well. I mean, he wouldn't do that. He'd just drink water. It's like <laughs> because we have this thing that you know the Jesus-like figure has to be some very sort of humble, but in a very sort of no lack of materialistic point of view and if that's the case Seneca doesn't work I mean Seneca and Stoicism like wouldn't work at all so it's the idea that even the sage would recognize that this chair that I'm sitting on is perhaps in certain circumstances when you're trying to do a podcast better than sitting on a cold floor but that I shouldn't I shouldn't put my identity or my you know like oh my gosh if I don't have that chair I haven't succeeded and that's the problem of of you know western society in many ways that if i or even now a chinese society is that because i don't have the chair i have i'm worthless whereas if i say okay the chair is worthless in terms of of my moral victories or failures it's just something that i sit on so i, I think like also it. the book tries Ep- to encourage people to think of that and I'm i was gonna say like like epictetus and his and the horse you know you say i have a fast horse therefore i'm better than you well, that doesn't exactly. make sense. Uh, you can say I have a horse that is faster than yours, but that doesn't reflect on your character in any way. It just reflects on a circumstance. Exactly. And why have a slower horse just for the sake of it? Because that, that's virtually signaling. And uh, I see a lot of that, particularly in America, but increasingly in the UK, where there's a lot of virtue signaling, a lot of becoming the victim. Uh, I don't want to spend too much time on this because I think it has enough media attention. But since when was becoming the victim stoic or even cool like when i was a kid mom was like never ever be the victim like always look for the best opportunity always see the best in people and right now what i'm seeing is that people some people some people and it's a minority but it's a sizable minority are looking for the worst in people they're tripping you know they're waiting for them to trip up on twitter they're waiting for them to trip up on 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 a, in a newspaper article. they're waiting for them to do the wrong thing so that they can slay them in you know in in the name of virtue I see that no difference in uh, the Salem witch uh, trials, to be honest. <laughs> it's like, let me, let me wait for you to make one mistake and burn you on Twitter. Nah. Like, let, me let, let, me, let me fire you from your job as a teacher. It doesn't matter that the kids love you. It doesn't matter that you've really helped you know, people who are in a difficult situation. We're going we're gonna to find a reason for, to fire you because you've said the wrong word. And it's like, this is just not stoicism. This is not rational. This is not reasonable. This is not wisdom because you just basically virtue signaling by by trying to say well i have a slow horse than you 
and you gave it to me and therefore it's your fault. Everything's your fault. Instead of getting <laughs> home, maybe you gave it to me. So maybe I can just either reject that you give it to me and go and get another one. Or I can be thankful for the fact you've given me a horse and at least I have one. So again, I was trying, we were also trying to show in the book that it wasn't left or right. The stoicism is really value neutral when it comes to politics, because the only thing that has value is the thing that is true. <laughs> and the thing that makes is, is reasonable enough and makes sense. It doesn't even have to be make sense to the majority. Like literally it, it actually makes sense and can stand firm on solid ground. And that's why we also tried to write a book that was, it was, didn't lean one way or the other. Obviously, we have our own personal leaning, but we try not. We try to use, you know, examples, modern examples of people who are definitely on the right, American right, and that are definitely on the American left. And then you can say, but they both have aspects of virtue that we can be sensible enough to to pick out what is virtuous and follow that. Because the other thing that I've noticed, I don't know if you have, that if you like a particular character, let's say you like J.K. Rowling because she's done a lot for poor people in the UK, but she makes, you know, she says a tweet that's not entirely sensible or well thought out. Now I have to disown her. And that's just so anti-stoic. It's just, it doesn't Much make like any the, sense. Much uh, like the beetle burnings in the South and in, in America in the 60s. <clears throat> they said something that, uh, that uh, they didn't like and they burned all the records and they probably went and bought them back again later, probably. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you had, I had that, you had that in the US with like Nike, people were like setting fire to Nike shoes. And like, you just paid for you, them. Nike doesn't you kill burned them your, you just set your money on fire basically. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of like the book is like asking you to think, think things through like, okay. Well, take, I think that's, away those things. yeah. A chapter on, uh, uh, is it is it Poseidonius, Posidonius? How do you say his name? Do you know? I probably say it wrong. I say Poseidonius, but I probably say it wrong. We should ask Leo. He's, he's the Greek one here. <laughs> he's the Greek one, right? Right. Yeah, I, I've always liked uh, this character just because of the, uh, the 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 vast interests that that he had in terms of of knowledge of because I I see you know oh boy someone who who doesn't say studying the world is stupid like some of the the ancients do. <laughs> um but that that chapter talked a little bit about living according to nature and the exercise of reason which is kind of you know a theme that you're bringing up uh several times here um and and also uh was it was it posidonius who who had the um or was it uh his mentor that had the um kind of the the group of of writers and and Benitez, his mentor yeah his mentor yeah mm-hmm. where, where they had a community of of uh, individuals as well to bounce ideas off of and then they they became influencers as it were yeah, and, yeah, and stoicism well. spread as 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 they uh, spread the word but it's interesting to see how people connect how people influence each other and then how ideas spread and without that connection if it was just a sage in a cave we wouldn't even know about Zeno, right? Absolutely. And I think you're absolutely right to bring it up. Like, again, we don't really, we don't, because we tend to, and I include myself in this, if it wasn't for the book, I could also be equally guilty. Like you read saying, you, you know, you read your, even your contemporary stoic stuff and you focus just on hepatitis, but you don't, and you probably know that he was linked to Rufus. But it's like, well, how is Rufus linked to this? Or how is Seneca linked to that? And how did like stoicism go from Greece to Rome, like I had never seen in a in a non-academic book, quite a big academic book, a real discussion about how it suddenly leaps, or seemingly suddenly leaps, from ancient uh, classical Greece to the Roman period. And that's we wanted to tell that story because we wanted to tell the journey of not just the individual Stoics, because again, we're not talking about sages, but this whole movement. Like one of my pet hates is that we talk about modern Stoicism versus ancient Stoicism. It's like actually there are the principles still follow if we are careful we can just call it stoicism right there's no reason why we call it ancient and and modern i prefer calling it ancient and contemporary because that's to me the stoic so we'd be contemporary stoic we wouldn't be ancient stoic but to me stoicism is stoicism and the only reason that we can kind of peg it in one way or the other is because we basically ignore the bridges because we tend to, as academics, we tend to go, right, I'm going to write about Seneca now. And we focus on what Seneca did and what Seneca said, but not really the relationships or how Seneca came to, hit, came, come to, have, came to have these ideas. So I, I like the idea that Leo and I went from, was like, okay, so Panaitis did this. And then he's, he was mentee with Pasadena. And this is what he did. And this is what he brought to the, to the picture. And I thought that was really fundamental because I hadn't seen that 
I had I didn't see that people saw stoicism as a collection of you know an inter, interlinked connection of ideas. I think they just saw it as it's the middle star, it's the old you know the ancient the early star. And John Tennyson was like, well, that's not really. I remember having a coffee with him in London. He goes, well, that's not really true. So I was like, hmm, I'll make a note <laughs> of this and I'll include it later. So I wanted to ask you, like, did you uh, when you read Pasadena's because it is quite a religious chapter. So as you're my in-house you know atheistic leaning guy on some level did you did it make you feel uncomfortable did you feel it was like really uh, really religious or very spiritual or how did you see that chapter that chapter eight the one on Pasadena, the one about uh, live according to nature right 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 well i i mean i don't i'm trying to think back i i guess i read enough uh, of the stoics where it's not uh i i, I don't get uh uh, uh, I don't get uncomfortable from with that kind of talk. I mean, I I consider myself a, uh, I guess you might say a uh, uh, a spiritual uh, a person in a sense. Uh, whether or not there's a uh, you know a uh, all knowing deity behind it, or or more of the 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 Tao or the the, the logos or 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 the laws of nature. Uh, uh, I see it as almost synonyms in a sense, and 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 it. Uh, it does not bother me in that sense, but I, I you know, I focused on like with Poseidonus uh, or Posidonius, uh, the uh, the I, I'm just impressed with his ability to look at the natural world to draw conclusions and to then try to tie some of that back into the the moral world, as it were, mm -hmm. which is what Zeno and Cleanthes and others were doing as well. But uh, but uh, uh, because he's kind of a, 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 a a, a biologist and a geologist and a philosopher and it's just very impressive i don't know i'm maybe i'm a sucker for those kinds of people those those people who just seem to to be what i i wish i could be but it's beyond my power to to be good at math and writing and 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 uh and know all the trees and and also be an excellent speaker and so on and so forth but but tell me why don't you explain <coughs> uh uh the relationship to religion, God, and, and, and this story here, just to flesh it out. So, yeah, I wanted to, me personally, Leo was like less keen because he's like, do not drag me into these religious debates. I would say, I personally would say he was quite spiritual, but very, very sort of in himself on that. He's not, but I don't care how many angels dance on the pin. <laughs> that's his, right. That's his Unnecessary, thing. yeah. And for him, it's unnecessary. And I felt that because of the way that the modern stories, stoic community, as opposed to the contemporary stoic community, had kind of said that they had no meaning, had no value. And Pasadonius, to me, is probably the most scientific stoic we have by a long way. Right. Like, he is like, you know, our hero, right? He's the academic who knows like everything. He's like the guy you wanted to have as your PhD supervisor, you just couldn't have it. Um, <laughs> You know, he, he was just so interested in the world and he was looking for patterns. And he didn't see this contradiction between spirituality, at least. And I, I would say spirituality because religion has a lot of connotations. So I wouldn't say religion, right. but certainly spirituality. They, they just I wanted to give like the, the contemporary stoics, like this guy is the most scientific stoic we have. He doesn't come to Massimo's conclusion that that God, the stoic God is, is uh, whimsical or pointless or just superficial or unnecessary, which is quite a skeptic kind of way of thinking, actually. So I wanted to show people because I'd heard that you couldn't kind of be both. You kind of had to throw out the baby with the bathwater. So I wanted to show that you could have a spiritual journey. And I wanted to do it in a very conventional way because I felt that people who are Christian, who are or Muslim or Jewish or, or even Buddhist might say, oh, but you're still saying, you're still calling me to be spiritual in a way that I don't feel comfortable. So in that particular chapter, we did really focus on the story of God, but then we gave examples of people that use their religion to make the world, you know, to live according to nature. Because I think it can also be dangerous when you say, well, these people are wrong. You know, there's no Yahweh or there's no Allah or whatever you want to say. So therefore they have no value. And I, I think that's really dangerous. And I think in philosophy, in terms of academically, we do do that. If you read our papers long enough as, as a community, I mean, I don't, but it is, it is prevalent that these people have no value and no meaning when it comes to this spiritual aspect. So we really wanted to show that human spirituality in Stoicism is fundamental. It's only through a spiritual outlet that you understand 
that you're part of, you're a node that belongs to a greater web, right? And that doesn't mean that that web has to be all knowing or powerful. It doesn't have to be, you know, what people would say was Jesus or, or God. It's just this understanding that goes beyond, say, the atoms, right? <laughs> that we understand the biology to say, right, there's something more. And to really reflect on, I would say, nature is this sacred, sacred script. I, I don't know I, if that uh, came across. Did that come I across? just gave a, a talk on Easter Sunday uh, to the uh, Unitarian Universalist Church in Little Rock on Stoicism um, via Zoom, of course. And uh, I used a figure from your paper on the uh, circles of concern. Uh, I'm sure you remember the figure, um, the, the 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 one that has the little drawings of like whales, dolphins, and yeah, and dolphins, the, and the and yeah, yeah. And uh, they, the comment was, uh, you know, it, that uh, uh, so many people focus on themselves, of course, and maybe their family, and maybe even their community a little bit. But until you bring in that outer ring of your connection to everything. It, it doesn't all congeal. It doesn't all gel. I guess you could say it's, it's, it, 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 it becomes much more meaningful, much more powerful. And you're much more likely to be kinder to others and, and things when you have that universal connection rather than just that, that those few inner circles uh, uh, that you focus on and that outer circle, whether it be nature or, 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 uh, you know, uh, uh, or you see it as something beyond nature, as it were, in the case of, of some religions that you have that, that uh, universal connection to, uh, to all those circles at that point, because of some kind of connection, well, whether it be external, the Big Bang or whether it be yeah, a God. Yeah. Yeah. And I did think that people don't focus on nature being the sacred script. Like, I do think that even if you even if one is atheist, one should think nature as sacred. There is something sacred about nature. And I use that word specifically because sacred gives you a connotation of to be honored, to be appreciated, to be worshipped for no other reason. This is what for no other reason than that, then you recognize the value of the thing you are worshiping or the thing that you hold dear that is not yourself. And I, and that's the danger I think that you can have. And you can you can be a slave to to you know neoliberalism and think the same way that it's all about how your choices and your rational choices about how to make your life better and sacred goes out of the window so it's kind of an invitation to think regardless of where you stood on the religious spectrum of the sacred scripture that is nature to look out your window and then the one you're behind you it's funny because we can't see the window right but um <laughs> to look out the window and say what is it that i don't understand what is it that I don't understand? And if I did understand, this is Pasadonius, if I did understand, I would just be so much closer to the truth. And academics, you know, and I'm being one, we don't normally look out the window for answers. We normally look on the screen. So we go back into human, like the human internet and human knowledge, and we deny, and we, and I, I honestly believe that, and I include myself, we too often deny that out there is something that something so much more complex and so much more interesting than any PDF I can you know, give you or send your way. And that's what we tried to do. So I, in a way, it was like, okay, you, I took you through the whole journey. And in the end, kind of said, okay, now I'm going to throw you the God idea. Because if I'd have given, thrown a hot potato like chapter three, I think a lot of people were like, that's it. Uh, closing the book. <laughs> this guy's like too out there. But I think most people actually have said to me, like they feel that they can be religious. They can capture whatever they're, their cultural aspect of Christianity typically is, and they can be stoic with it. And I think that's great because it, I mean, it might create some cognitive dissonance for some people, but I think there's a lot of cognitive dissonance when people like say, right, I'm, you know, I'm stoic now and they throw away their whole cultural identity. And then they say that, you know, Catholicism or Protestant aspects have no value and no meaning. So in, in the book that we give the example of the Cambridge central mosque you know, and how they've created a mosque, that is, that is completely, as much as they can, environmentally friendly. And it makes sense. If you pray five times a day in a mosque, which they are currently doing is Ramadan, if you pray five times a day in a mosque, then probably your mosque should be in alignment with nature. And that does involve having sustainable wood and it does involve thinking carefully about your ventilation and how you can save energy and therefore carbon emissions. And I think that's what's been lost sometimes when we try to cut stores them into, you know, it's the ethics, it's the theology, it's the epistemology. That's not how the Stoics really saw it. They might teach it in that classroom, but it was an understanding of the whole 
that really made it a powerful um, art of living. So what's your favorite chapter? The one that I, the one that I enjoyed myself or the one that I, I think uh, other people, it's my favorite when other people read it because I actually got two arms. <laughs> oh, wow. You have a, a, a bifurcated answer here. <laughs> All right, let's I go do. with Kai, Dr. Kai's favorite f- for his own personal reasons. For my own personal reasons, it was definitely chapter eight for the reasons because I just didn't, I had not seen it. It the, was one my idea. Just, the one we just yeah, talked, we just the live according yeah. to nature. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. What about but for others? I like chapter seven because it, it really like, it throws, you know, throws a really sharp sort of, this is absolutely wrong. That's this, the stories had no strong females. I mean, Aji is as tough as boots. Like, you know, you're not going to, you're not going to, you know, destroy me. You can kill my husband and I'm still going to do what I want. I'm still going to live my ideals. And I may have this tiny, tiny moment of power. And she was very powerless at certain stages. I won't ruin it here. But she still manages to go, right, I'm going to use my power as a woman. I'm not going to play victim. I'm going to use my power as a woman and I'm going to do something. A lot of people at that point, men included, say, oh, it's beyond my control. I'm sitting, I'm in prison. Oh, I can't do anything. And that to me was like a really sort of powerful thing to tell people, more powerful for some people than say chapter eight who are not spiritually inclined. It's like, next time you say that's always beyond your control. Next time you say that stoicism is a male dominated thing, like in that women don't really have much to say or, you know, they're pretty much science. You haven't done the, the research that I've done. You haven't looked at spa. So that's why I love when I give uh, chapter seven. Also because a lot of people, like you said, like would say, I don't know anything about spheres. I didn't even know spheres existed. And then once you realize that stories existed, you can't then say to me, stoicism is an individualistic pursuit. It is literally impossible to, to hold the Spartan example about how stoicism brings an economic and land reform, definitely not individuals feeling calmer about themselves, and say to me, okay, that happened, but it's an individualistic pursuit. So I actually really enjoy it when people like um, message me and after I say to them, you know, read chapter seven and talk to me. And go, this just opened my eyes to this whole new aspect of stoicism that I didn't even know existed. Whereas chapter I, I like, it's kind of like I'm rescuing something that I think is <laughs> value. Whereas chapter seven is like, okay, go guys and run with it. Like I would love that people went and ran with chapter seven and because it's called educate, you know, only the educated are free and literally educated themselves on this, these aspects. Because I think with chapter eight, you can run with it, but it's much more internal. So I don't think it would be much as, as empowering in someone's own mind in the same way. Well, Kai, is there anything else you want to discuss before we uh, yeah, just, uh, ourselves adieu? My, my last question is, what is the kind of person you would recommend the book to? Having now read it, who's the kind of person that you would recommend it to? Because I, I, I don't think it's necessary for everybody. So but I'd like to... See what you think. And so who is it for and who is it not so much for? I see. Um, well, I think that uh, I was thinking of, of uh, some of, I think a, 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 uh, I don't know if they'd read it, but uh, the, uh, the, those leaning towards the broic side of things should be exposed to it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> like as a antidote <laughs> uh, perhaps, but I also thought that, uh, like I just said, I talked to the folks at the uh, the Unitarian Universalist Church here in Little Rock, where you know you have kind of uh, free thinkers in the middle of the of the of the uh, the Bible, you know, people who are seeking spirituality or and philosophy and like to think about these things, but they might be put off by what they think Stoicism is, uh, so they don't even want to walk in the door. Mm-hmm. Um, this, you know, a book like this shows you that it's not about running a successful company and getting really fit at the gym there's there's a social uh complexity here that you may miss depending on where your entry point to stoicism is so i was thinking it would be a a good book for uh for uh, folks in that realm um I don't know who it would be not for uh like i said there may be some who see it who only want stoicism as a self-help philosophy who may then not care about its social implications and how uh, others relate to, uh, how you relate to others and the planet for example you know as, as you may uh, uh, 
or as you make clear in, in several of these chapters. So um, I don't know if, do you think there's some people who you would just not recommend it to? I mean, you're the well, author. Yeah, I definitely, I would, if somebody said to me, I want Stoicism to do one thing for me, they would just be frustrated with this book because this book is not about helping you do one thing well. Unless the one thing well is to think things through properly. If that's what you mean by one thing. When normally people say one thing, they were like, I want to be a better student. I right. wanna I wanna be a better fireman. Sure. I want to be like if if you if you're talking about me giving you the framework to do that, then yes, then you should read the book. If you're talking like I really want and it, and it's 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 not unreasonable to want give me like I, like you might say, Kai, you've published a book. What exactly must I do to get published? You don't want me to be like, let me give you the, no, you want like A, B, C, D. And if that's the person, I would say, don't read it because you can get really annoyed. Like, well, if you it, just want to solve a distinct yeah, problem, that's going to annoy you. I was going to say it's a good book if you want to um, ponder, to think, uh, to to think, to, to uh, uh, you mentioned evaluating, you know, are you doing things now because you were, told to do them when you were a teenager or a little kid or you know have you are you a, are, are you are you and i'm not saying anything about a particular chapter here necessarily but i'm just saying if you want to be able to to read a chapter then think and see how it applies or how how it uh can apply to your life then it's a good book for that but it's a book for um life philosophy not life hacking in that sense it's about um it's not a Hey, did you know you can save 10 minutes off your routine every day if you do these steps? It's that's not what it is. Um, but it is something to chew on mentally. Uh, and you do have some questions at the end of each chapter. How how does this apply to you? How could this apply, you know, if if it helps you to meditate on 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 that chapter and how it how it might change your view of of the way things are or your life philosophy? It you have a few questions to, to aid in that direction. There is, like you said, it is a self-help book, but it is not a, um, it's a life philosophy. <laughs> I don't know what I want to say here. It's a broad life philosophy, self-help, not a uh, 10 steps to uh, being a better lover kind of uh, self-help book or whatever. Yeah. Exactly. We wanted to give you like, we wanted to say, okay, here's where you get the paint. Here's the kind of paintbrushes you want. If you're going to pick a sturdy, you know, pick a sturdy one. But if you want to do it like really thin, then you did, you, you know, get that paintbrush. If you want a thicker brush, then get that one, but get a good one, get a good paintbrush, whatever paintbrush it is that you want. You want good ink, you know, you want an ink, you want blue, you want red. That's really irrelevant to me, but get a good quality ink. Like this is the kind of the thing that we were doing. And, and when I was talking to people, they just really struggled with it. I would say, you people that really got it got it and people were like no i just really want you to tell me what to do and, and i ended up saying to them that's just not stories and as unpopular as that sounds and that's okay like i came to the conclusion through writing this book that that eudaimonia is open to all and in theory like everybody wants it right but in practice not everybody's willing or prepared to to take that step right because they want they want eudaimonia to be the same path so you and i steve we have exactly the same path and that's what they want. And it's like, no, because, for example, just to give you the last example, if someone's dying in the street and you're a doctor, virtuous actions to you might be a whole complicated process of how you check, you know, if they're breathing and then doing certain things that I don't even know how to explain. I'm not a doctor. Right. My, my virtuous thing to do is not do any of that. That's completely not virtuous because I don't know what I'm doing is to make a phone call. And that throws, so we both have the obligation to do everything in our power to do the best we can do for that person. But whatever the best is depends on who we are, what we do and the reasons we're doing it. So if I try to help that person, they'd probably say, Kai, you are guilty of manslaughter. What on earth were you doing? You should <laughs> never, ever picked up that scalpel. Like, what were you thinking? Yeah, put down the scalpel, Kai. Yeah. So that's what the kind of thing, like I said, the only thing that's true is that both Steve and I have the same moral obligation to do all we can to help that person who is, say, dying in the street. But what the exact the steps we take are different. And some people... I've realized, and I was really sad when I came to this realization, but I realized they don't want that. And that's fine, but it's not stories. It reminds me of, from my perspective as a biologist of, uh, and I think I've said this before, but <clears throat> of uh, evolution by natural selection. Uh, we all have suites of characters and, you know, let's, you know, using an imaginary organism here, um, if you stick that organism in habitat one, it will flourish. If you stick it 
it, if you stick it in habitat too, it's going to be eaten or 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 starved to death. You know, it has. Uh, but but uh, it, it depends on what characteristics that organism has, how it should, where it's going to work, where it's going to flourish, where um, it will be successful. And so we all have our own backgrounds, our own traits, our own uh, internal natures, our own human nature. You know, well, then we have shared human nature. Uh, so we have some things in common and we all have the one of the things we have in common is the obligation to help in that situation, but then our own individual natures are exactly what that means for you in that situation. Uh, um, how do you thrive in the situation is different than how I thrive in that situation. And so when I have a car that's uh, broken down, I usually take it to a mechanic. Whereas my, my dad thinks that that is unvirtuous. He thinks that you get out the wrench and you get under the hood and you fix it yourself. Where if I did that, I would make things worse. <laughs> you know, so <laughs> like you said, you had the human example. I just used a mechanical one, but um, uh, how you react, how you, how, how you should react is not a formula necessarily uh, that's specific to everyone. It's contingent on your uh, experiences, your expertise, your uh, knowledge of yourself. You must know yourself to know how you need to react in a situation. I mean, that's a good start and end of your start with the Oracle, and I think you just ended with the Oracle. So it's exactly what she said. So thank you very much uh, for having me. And Thank you very much for giving me the space and time to discuss elements of this book. And yeah, uh, I'm hoping that some of your readers are shout you out basically oh you know and they tell me for their reviews or whatever they do or they just reach out to me and go oh, i was listening to it that would be that would be really great but well, thank you very much steve i appreciate well, thank it. you and make sure to check out uh the the uh the uh, new book being better stoicism for a world worth living in uh hopefully available from many venues many locations soon um definitely available already in the united states coming soon uh to the UK and other places. So check it out. Carpe diem, Kai. Thanks, Steve. Thank you for listening to The Sunday Stoic. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe, rate, and review The Sunday Stoic on iTunes. Become a member of The Sunday Stoic team, earn rewards, and be an integral part of the show by becoming a patron at www.patreon.com slash sundaystoic. Contact the show by emailing sundaystoic at gmail.com or by leaving a voicemail at 501-503-3132. To find out more, visit www.sundaystoicpodcast.com. And as Steve always says, carpe diem. Carpe diem.